Welcome to all of our YouTube channel. There are many folks around the country uh, who are using this class and uh, they get in touch. And I want to remind all of you around the country uh, that the camera adds 10 pounds. So uh, we want to <laughs> make sure. <laughs> Uh, let's look first at, you, have, you all have an outline? We're going to just do some, uh, some biblical foundations, and uh, if this is kind of new thinking for you, it'll establish a few things, but you're gonna, we're going to be coming back over and over and over again to these passages, uh, so tonight will not be the first uh, time that you see them. Uh, then I'm going to give you seven key concepts. Uh, that uh, we will again come back to over and over and over again. And then we'll talk about creaturely thinking, just some basics uh, in uh, the structure and the workflow of idolatry and, and how that all works. All right, does that make sense? So in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the Garden of Eden, uh, everybody sort of knows the story. God created Adam and Eve, uh, and, the, and behold, it was all very good. There's nothing bad about it at all. In fact, you know, we kind of joke, but it's not a joke at all. The only bad thing was that uh, Adam was all alone. And God said, well, that's bad. I'm going to fix that. Uh, and so Adam and Eve decided, though, ultimately uh, to believe the serpent. And what was uh, the, the uh, temptation? You shall be like God. That is the ultimate sin uh, it is the ultimate thing that separates us from our Creator. It's the ultimate thing that creates distance between us and God. Is the fact is that deep in our heart of hearts, we want to be God. We don't want to be told what to do. Uh, we, we have learned to fix that language up. Uh, we know better than to go up and, uh, uh, and tell friends and family that we'd like to be God. You know, they'll straighten you out pretty quick. But in our hearts, we don't want to be told what to do. We don't believe that there's an authority above us. There's nothing that can challenge our thought forms. Uh, we are our own highest authority. Uh, and now, of course, you're in a culture that tells you that. Uh, with one hand and then takes it back from you with the other. And we're going to show you how that ends up working. So God uh, disciplined Adam and Eve. Uh, and there's one phrase uh, that we have to remember. And the phrase is this. God is speaking and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. So uh, God is speaking to Satan and enmity means exactly what it says. Forever, the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan, Satan has offspring. And the offspring of Satan are those who do not believe in Christ. And the offspring of the woman is who? Christ himself. And all those who united him in faith. And God judicially imposes enmity. I will place that in that relationship. And enmity is war. There's never going to be any neutral ground. There is no spiritual Switzerland. You will either be for Christ or you will be against Christ. Uh, and Jesus put it in ways that we find stark because we're not used to hearing Jesus speak. But do you remember what Jesus said? You are of your father, the devil. Uh, so Jesus makes it very clear uh, that you are either uh, guided by your heavenly father or you are guided by your father, the devil. There is no middle ground. And so uh, because that's true, there is no opportunity to find a safe space for thought. You will either have a mind that thinks God's thoughts after him, a mind that reflects your creator, or you will have a mind that goes reeling off into the willy wags without your creator. It really amounts to that. And so our job is to make sure that we're self-conscious about what we think and why that we think it. Uh, and this is exactly uh, what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians. So we'll turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. And you'll see... Uh, Uh, 
Second uh, Corinthians chapter six, beginning at verse fourteen. <clears throat> Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Uh, notice what the contrast is. We either participate in righteousness or we participate in lawlessness. Uh, the opposite of righteousness is lawlessness. And what is lawlessness? Lawlessness is a disregard for the law of God, uh, which you commonly know as the Ten Commandments. Uh, so uh, Christ comes, he perfectly lives the law and gives it to you as a gift. His obedience becomes your gift in salvation. Uh, and the Holy Spirit then uh, indwells your heart and conforms you to the image of the law-keeping Christ. He empowers you to keep the law of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Christ was the law keeper and we were law breakers. Uh, and so the opposite of righteousness is lawlessness. For what partnership has right, uh, righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from among their midst and be separate from them, saith the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty." So uh, there is a complete uh, line in the sand between belief and unbelief. Uh, there is not the opportunity uh, to say uh, that we can be, you know, a little bit Christian. Uh, we are uh, completely compelled to either be uh, guided by light or to be guided by darkness. There is no middle ground to that at all. Uh, and so the point uh, that Paul makes here, and he reminds Christians at Corinth, there is no fellowship with light and darkness. So you shouldn't anticipate, uh, and we'll see this Sunday in Peter, but you shouldn't anticipate that you'll find great fellowship. You're going to be disagreed with. You can fully anticipate, if you think like a Christian in an ungodly world, that you will be disagreed with. Uh, remember what Jesus said? Uh, woe is unto you when all men speak well of you. Uh, you shouldn't anticipate being well liked. Uh, you shouldn't anticipate that uh, whatever you think that is guided by the Spirit of the living God is then therefore going to be accepted by sinners. Sinners do not accept the law of God. They are, by definition, lawless. They disregard the law of God. You say, well, that sounds kind of harsh. Well, let's just go down through the Ten Commandments and see how much your culture... So does your culture get up in the morning and honor the Lord their, uh, the, our, our God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? They don't even know Him. Uh, do, do they value anything above God? Everything. Do they take the Lord's name in vain? Daily. Do they honor their mother and father? No, they write books about them. Do they remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? They do not. That's a day for entertainment and football. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery isn't something that's uh, simply put up with. It's celebrated. You can find an app on your phone so you can do it quickly. Uh, do not covet. The whole culture is built on jealousy. I want what you have, and I resent that I don't have it. 
Uh, really? If you live the law of God in this culture, you will stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah, you simply will. Uh, and, that, and that is the point uh, that Paul's making. There's not going to be any fellowship with light and darkness. You're, not, you're just not going to have that. Uh, turn over t- uh, to 2 Corinthians 10. Uh, and you'll see again in verses 4 and 5. Uh, Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's the work of the gospel ministry, by the way. That's the work of you as a Christian. You're not obligated to acquiesce to dumb ideas. You're not. Uh, You are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, verse 5. And so what that means is that when our thought forms disagree with the law of God, uh, then we ask our thought forms to repent. God is right, we're wrong. By the way, and you hear me say this all the time, if Jesus rose from the dead, (laughs) he's right about everything. (laughs) Right? He's not wrong about anything at that point, is he? Uh, So the question will always be the one that was asked in the Garden of Eden. Is God right or am I right? It it boils down to that. It's binary. It's light or it's darkness. Uh, Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, verse 6, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Uh, You see how stark this is? Uh, this is, there's only two options, just two, uh, and we have to decide uh, where we're going to be in that. Now, uh, the quintessential passage, and again, we're going to get back to all of these over the 12 weeks, but I just want to introduce them, but Romans chapter 1, and we'll uh, look at verse 18, and now uh, this will transition us into the seven key concepts. <clears throat> Romans uh, chapter 1. Uh, by the way, we are in First Peter right now. We will finish First Peter, Lord willing, this year. <laughs> no, we'll get it finished. And then we're doing Romans next. Uh, and then we'll be in that for five years. I don't know how long it'll take me to get through Romans. It'll be a while. <laughs> but we'll do Romans next. But I just want you to see the premise... Uh, Beginning at verse uh, 18, and I'll read down through verse 32. And we'll come back to this over and over again, so I won't unpack it completely tonight. We won't have time for that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So remember what lawlessness is designed to do. Lawlessness is designed to be an intentional mechanism to defend themselves against truth. Truth is not welcome. Truth is not wanted. Uh, So that's the point that he's making. Uh, Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Uh, What God is saying in this passage is there is no one in the world who doesn't know God. Nobody. Uh, And the reason for that is everybody in the world was created in God's image. And because God is so visible in the created order, so obviously known in the created order, uh, that that leaves every single human being culpable regardless of their uh, truth claims that there is no God. Uh, If there's no God, why are you so busy fighting and getting mad about that? I ask every atheist, if there's no God, why are you so ticked off? Why would you get so angry at a fantasy, if it's truly a fantasy? Wouldn't that be on the order of insanity on your part? 
<laughs> it would be. I mean, if, it, you know, if I lost my mind over a fantasy, wouldn't you think that I would need help? I mean, you may think that now, but <laughs> it would be a problem, right? So they're without excuse. You're never going to talk to a person who doesn't know there is a God. You're only ever going to talk to a person who denies the God that they know to be true. And the reason they deny him is why? They don't want God to tell them what to do. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Uh, and so in verse uh, 21, For although they knew God, remember, they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Uh, so uh, the consequence of denying uh, a God that you know is there, the consequence of that is in your thinking. And your thinking becomes futile and silly. Uh, some of you are looking around your culture and you're saying, I just don't understand how it's possible to come to that conclusion. And this passage tells you why. You can fully anticipate that people uh, who have denied that there is a God, even though in their heart they know there is one, that denial creates a disintegration in the way that people put thoughts together. They become futile in their thinking and darkened in their understanding. They're not more insightful, they're actually uh, less uh, in, uh, insightful. So claiming to be wise, verse 22, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But the point is simply this. If you deny that there is a creator above you, it's not that you will worship nothing at all. It's that you will begin to worship everything. And so uh, the everything that you will worship, though, because you deny that there's a creator above the creation, is that you will look within the creation to find something of value that will give your life meaning and significance. Uh, because you have denied the ultimate transcendent significance of the God who created you. And when you deny that, you still need significance. You still need meaning. You still don't know what time it is. You still don't know what from down. You're still unsettled. And so you'll look for things within the creation to solve that problem. We have another name for that. We call that fads. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. In verse 24, Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So what uh, happens is that if you deny God and you say uh, that uh, there is no such a thing as a creator above me, I uh, spontaneously generated on my own. Uh, I am my highest authority. Uh, there's nothing above me, uh, then God will turn you over to that. And there will be nothing that you won't worship. Uh, and when that happens, uh, you begin, begin to worship every crazy little thing, including your own body. Uh, and I think I just described your whole culture to you. Uh, but we'll see this played out. Uh, but what we don't want to do, remember, because we have the rest of the book of Romans here, but this is not an opportunity for us to point fingers and be snarky. This is an opportunity for us to be saddened and go to our knees in prayer and to bring the gospel to folks who are so lost in their lives that they will end up worshiping virtually anything. And so it's our job not to make fun of them. It's our job to say, listen, Here's your creator. Here's Jesus Christ. Here's an opportunity out. 
here's a way to find significance and meaning. I just want to make sure we have that in our head. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Uh, so if you worship the creation, uh, what will ultimately happen is it's not merely uh, that uh, sexuality will be turned on its head and flipped on its head. It won't be merely accommodated, it will be celebrated. It will be something, and once it begins to be celebrated, then the demand will be that you celebrate it too. Uh, by the way, this is not new news, I hope. Uh, this was written 2,000 years ago. Right? 2,000 years ago. So if you think uh, that you're in a culture that's coming up with new information, they're just as sloppy as they were 2,000 years ago. You know, not much has improved. Uh, verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. Mind. In other words, this is going to be how you end up thinking. To do what ought not to be done, they were fulfilled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, if that doesn't read like the New York Times to you, I don't know what to say. But God is right about everything. He's never wrong. And this information is 2,000 years old. Uh, and when we get to Book of Romans on Sunday morning, you'll see that all Paul is doing is teaching you in modern language in his day the law of Moses. <laughs> There's nothing new. All right? There's nothing new. So what are the seven key concepts we learn from those passages? First of all, all right? First, number one, the creator. Creature distinction. The creator-creature distinction. Uh, to properly think as a Christian, uh, you must always remember that the creature never becomes the creator. And the creator never, ever descends to become a creature. There is always a complete line in the sand with that. Uh, and what you, we'll begin to see next week is uh, what's called the perennial philosophy. Uh, if you can count to two, you can be a good theologian. Uh, because all you have to understand is everything that dishonors God uh, and says no to God becomes what we call oneism. Everything is the same. Everything is one. And you've heard this in popular ways. We're all on the... Uh, many paths to the, to the mountain. When we get there, it's all the same God. You are, we're all one. You're one with the animals. Uh, you're one with everything else. Everything is one thing. When uh, you hear that philosophy, uh, what you have to understand is you're not hearing erudite thought. You're hearing paganism. And I'll show you where that all came from. Always remember that Christian thinking is two. There's always a creator, and there's always a creature. Always, always, always. All right? The, the second thing is uh, the ju judicially imposed antithesis. So, uh, we read in Genesis uh, 3.15 that the judgment of God imposed the complete distinction between light and darkness. Righteousness and lawlessness will always be opposites. They're never going to merge. 
And what that means as you begin to think through issues Christianly, uh, you're going to have less and less opportunity to compromise. Compromise is unchristian at its root. Because compromise says that God has missed cue on a particular uh, idea. Uh, and that ha had he thought this through more, he would have also included satanic ideas. And so you're going to hear me use very stark language. I'm going to talk about pagans versus Christians, and I'm going to talk Christ versus Satan. Because that is the antithesis that you're dealing with. Light and darkness have no fellowship. They cannot be together. They cannot be together. Um, third is general revelation and common grace. Now that's an important topic because uh, you can get to the end of 1 and 2 and think, okay, there's uh, nothing good that can come from a sinner. And you're going to be really wrong if you think that. Because remember, there are, every sinner is created in the image of God. And you remember what Paul said in Romans 1? Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. So a lot of people who know God create things like turbine engines. And dentistry. And uh, heart transplants. And in utero surgery and rockets that go to the moon. You can fully expect image bearers of God to do wonderful things. Uh, what is the problem? Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. So they'll create the turbine engine and say, I take all credit for that. There was no God above my science. There's nothing wrong with science at all. There's nothing wrong with technology. It's all good in the creation. What's wrong is that sinners take the science that God created, the molecular structure that he put in to order his universe, and they take that and they uh, create something that God uh, allows, and then they say, I did it on my own, and there's no such a thing as God that allowed me to get here. That's the problem. So you can expect sinners to do amazingly good things with technology. Uh, and you can expect within every bad idea to find the germ of truth. Because they are image bearers. Uh, one of my uh, professors uh, in seminary used to put it this way, uh, and, and he was a counseling professor, uh, and, and so we, he was talking you know, in the field of, of psychology and counseling, and he would say, uh, you know, these people are great with descriptive riches. In other words, they can describe the problem like crazy. They will put the finger on what the evil is that needs to be solved. Well, that's general revelation and common grace. God gives grace to everyone to allow them to live. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. But the solution to the evil will be evil. Because the only thing that can solve evil is the righteousness of Christ. And everything that tries to solve evil outside of the righteousness of Christ itself becomes evil. It cannibalizes itself. Uh, so uh, when we go through some of these isms, you'll see, well, they're absolutely right about what the problem is. I, uh, I'd be mad too. Right? They're completely correct about the problem, and they're completely incorrect about the solution to the problem. And the reason they're incorrect about the solution is they refuse to acknowledge the, uh, the God who created them, and the God who created them is the only one with the power and the wisdom to conquer the evil that bothers them. That's common grace. That's common grace. That's general revelation. Uh, so the difference between general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is that God has revealed himself in the created order. 
Uh, do you see what uh, Paul said? In, in the invisible, in his invisible attributes, his eternal power, the divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. That's general revelation. The fact uh, that the world is as it is, uh, is enough. Everybody knows it. You go to the Grand Canyon, you know, say to yourself, wow, that was a real stroke of luck. That's beautiful. What everybody says is, wow, there's something going on here. This is amazing. Uh, and that's general revelation. And that makes them culpable before God. Uh, when they stand before the great white throne judgment, God will say, you knew, didn't you? You knew who I was, and you denied me. And that's precisely going to be the problem. General revelation is going to... People always ask me the question, well, how come, what's going to happen if they didn't hear about Jesus and they're, you know, they're off in the woolly wags out, you know, out in the jungle? And general revelation... His invisible attributes have been seen so every person ever born on the face of the earth knew there was a God. And because he had created in his image, the law of God is written across the conscience of mankind, he'll later say in chapter 2. And that is enough to make every human being ever born culpable for denying the God they knew to exist. And so we always think about general revelation and common grace. Uh, fourth is the gospel. Uh, and the gospel, I want you to add a word there, and this is my fault. Creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. Creation, uh, fall, redemption, and consummation. And consummation, uh, so d just, we're going to use this pattern for every ism that you know. The gospel comes and, and provides the good news that God has created the world. And he's created each and every one of us in his image, which gives us meaning and significance. We are not uh, the uh, sort of uh, lucky scramble of impersonal molecules that randomly erupted if that's true, you have no meaning. You're nothing. But what gives you meaning is that you're created in the image of God. Uh, and since you're created in the image of God, uh, you have significance by virtue of that alone. But that significance, that image bearer, was uh, given the freedom to say no, and did. And in that uh, abuse, of the freedom that God granted, they denied God and said, we don't need God. And that was the fall. That's, that was the break in the relationship. That's what creates all the distance between us and God. That creates the emptiness in our lives because we're disconnected uh, from our Creator. We've gotten a long way from home. And we feel lonely and we don't know how to get back. Uh, but because Christ, uh, in His mercy... God and very God, the second eternal person of the Trinity, took on human flesh. And he said, no one can do this but me. I'll come and do it for myself. And so, uh, the second eternal person of the Trinity, God the Son, takes on human flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. We call that Christmas, right? He takes on human flesh, and he perfectly lives the law of God. He goes to Calvary, and he pays the penalty for all of our disrespect, disobedience, uh, and uh, towards uh, our holy creator. And that is redemption. Uh, and then I forgot to put in the word consummation. Consummation uh, is simply that what Jesus promised uh, when he ascended on high, he said, Lo, I will send a comforter, and lo, I will be with you always until the end of the age. And uh, then he promises to return in power and glory uh, and to reestablish his creation. Uh, he is uh, simply uh, going to uh, uh, create the new heavens and the new earth. It's not merely that you're going back to the Garden of Eden. You're going back to the Garden of Eden, which is beyond that which you could hope or think. It's better. It's going to be better than ever. He's reestablishing all of his creation. That's the gospel. Now, every one of these isms, wokeism, statism, uh, selfism, all these things give you a counterfeit gospel. They all have a narrative that says, uh, 
gives you a creation story. This is how you got here. Uh, and then that uh, narrative includes, this is what the problem is. This is evil. Uh, and so, you know, if, if it's... Uh, 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 if it's a statism, you know, the problem is oppression or something of that sort. And we'll go through all these and do the matrices so you can see them. Uh, so there's always an evil to be solved. And then they give you a story of redemption. The best way to solve this problem is, you know, selfism. You become a better you and you can fix this. Uh, statism, trust, trust the state more and, we, and we'll, we'll be your redeemer. <laughs> Uh, and then they all, all these counterfeit Gospels have a story of a consummation. Where will this take you? It will take you to Nirvana. It will take you to Utopia. It will take you to all these different places. Uh, each one of these, as we look at them, you're going to see so clearly that they're all simply false Gospels. They're, it's not good news at all. In fact, it's going to end up being very, very bad news. Uh, and the narrative is going to be one that offers you a creation story that eliminates uh, the Creator God. It's going to offer you a story of the fall that eliminates you as the problem, but there is evil to be solved. It's going to offer you redemption, deliverance from that evil, but that deliverance is not going to come in the form of the sacrificial and substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on Calvary, but it's going to come in human form, because remember, everything has to come from within the creation. Now that you've denied the Creator, the creation is the Creator, the creation is the problem, the creation is the solution to the problem, and the consummation is going to be something in creation. We'll be able to solve global warming. We'll have utopia. Now granted, a few of us will have to go, because you know the planet can't take everybody. We're going to have to depopulate a little bit, and we're, you know, we're awfully sorry about that. <laughs> But I'll be safe in my private jet on the way to Davos, and so I won't worry about it, but, you know, this has to happen. It's, a, it's the promise of a utopia without Christ. So all of these isms uh, are going to unpack amazingly in a simple way. And when you see them, all you're going to say is, okay, that's another false gospel. And that will give you the tools uh, from this day forward, because if you think we're done with this, you know, I'm reading you information that's 2,000 years old. Uh, and uh, if you don't think, should the Lord tarry, uh, that we're not going to have more and more of everything you're seeing now, but under a different name, a different fad, a different idea. I mean, just look what has happened in our lifetimes. Just look what has happened in our lifetimes. I'm 64 years old. You know, they told us in the 60s, all we had to do to be happy is just have a little more sex. How'd that work out? Uh, now we're told, a little something else to be happy. Right? There's always going to be something new. Uh, but you'll be prepared for it when you unpack it as a false and counterfeit gospel. Say, okay, uh, what is the story? What, what in this is uh, telling me how I got here? How was I created in this narrative? And what's the evil problem in this narrative? And how am I delivered from the evil? And uh, what is the consummation? Where is, what's the end game? What's, you know, what do I get if I go along to get along? And those will all be false gospels, and they'll, they'll become virtually silly to you because you've understood the true gospel. Uh, you, you know how they teach treasury agents uh, to, to uh, know a counterfeit $20 bill, right? They teach them everything about a real dollar bill. They, they, they know a real $20 bill so well that they can spot a counterfeit instantly. So it's not because counterfeits are infinite, right? You can't, I mean, there's always some permutation of the counterfeit. So you'll know the gospel so well, and you'll be able to think so clearly that everything that's a fad and comes against the gospel and is a counterfeit, it'll just be obvious to you, and then you'll understand why Paul says, well, they're just futile in their thinking and darkened in their understanding. And they, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And it's tragic. It's not something you poke a finger at. It's not something you laugh at. It's just tragic. And you have to bring the genuine gospel to bear 
in the life of someone who's adopted the counterfeit gospel. Because the counterfeit gospel we'll see every single time is designed to do one thing. Kill you. Satan's job is to kill you. Jesus' job is to give you resurrection life. Those are the only two options. Right? All right. So, general revelation, common grace, the gospel. Uh, and what I just described, we're creaturely counterfeits. The reason I give you handouts is because my uh, penmanship is illegible, completely illegible. So these creaturely, uh, these counterfeits, uh, there's always going to be something that counterfeits the good news of the gospel. So everything you see, uh, you have to say to yourself, why is this coming down the pike? And the reason it's coming down the pike is because you're de in, once you deny your creator, you have to come up with one. You have to come up with the reason why you're here. You have to come up with your own good news. And so all these things are counterfeit gospels. Uh, and once you realize the counterfeit gospel, uh, you'll, you'll be on your way to distinguishing darkness from light. Uh, Jesus is the new humanity. All of these isms, wokeism, selfism, statism, and if I had time, we could do another ten. But all of them are offering you a different way to be human. They're saying if you'll organize your life around this particular counterfeit gospel, you will enjoy an enhanced humanity. You will flourish more if you accept the counterfeit gospel than if you uh, trust this crazy Jesus guy. And that is always the offer that's on the table. But remember what Jesus came to do. In the Garden of Eden, God created the created order. God created the created order. In other words, God structured the universe to work in a certain and particular way. And because Adam rebelled against that in what is clearly cosmic treason and said, I want to be God, he was expelled from the garden. Uh, and now, uh, the promise was that the knowledge of the Lord would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea, but that promise is not going to be fulfilled in an Adam who has rebelled against his Creator. So God, in Jesus Christ, shows up to be the second Adam, Romans chapter 5 and in Corinthians. And Jesus is who Adam was supposed to be. He is the second Adam. And he perfectly fulfills all of the creation mandates. Perfectly fulfills all the created order as God designed it. And he is uh, the perfect human. He is God and very God and 100% human at the same time. In the hypostatic union. And I realize that's a mind bender. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, on his side that's 100% human, you have to understand what Jesus is, is the perfect human. He's everything God wanted in a human. Everything the Heavenly Father said a human should look like. Everything that Adam was supposed to do and didn't do, Jesus did. And when you are now united to him in faith and trusting in him alone to restore you and reconcile you to your creator the spirit's work in your life is to conform you to the image of the perfect human which means you will not flourish as a human unless you do it this way every path that you take 
that is a counterfeit piece of good news, even though it will start off by smelling really good, will take you down to a path that leaves you at the sewage dump. Every single time. Uh, and this is what happens over and over again. And we can see it historically. Uh, and it's easy to look back and say, oh yeah, I can see what happened now. That was terrible. But the problem is we live in a now and often we live in a now as frogs in the kettle that's boiling and we don't realize that we're in the water. And so you need the tools to know, hey, this is not the way to be human. It's actually a way to dehumanize yourself. And this is what Paul is saying in Romans 1. He turns you over to the creature. And so you become creaturely, you become like an animal, instead of like a son of God. That's the distinction. Uh, and you remember, uh, and I brought these, the seven creational norms. Uh, we did this a couple uh, classes ago. The, one was the creator-creature distinction. That's one of the norms that are in creation. Uh, the uh, Imagio Dei, the image of God, that's norm. Every human being is created in the image of God. Uh, uh, the male-female distinction. Uh, God creates male and female. You can never, ever get rid of that without destruction. And you're going to see a lot of destruction moving forward a lot and it's going to be heartbreaking it's just going to be heartbreaking uh, number four the cultural mandate uh, that uh, Adam and Eve were not supposed to stay in the garden they were supposed to use the garden uh, as uh, the, uh, the starting blocks for the whole earth and they were to fill the earth with the glory of the Lord uh, and they were to do that through developing the culture to the glory of God we're still called to do that that's what Jesus said. That's why you need to be salt and light. Uh, we don't go park ourselves on a mountain. Uh, uh, we have to engage in the culture and be salt and light. And uh, come on Sunday, this is what Peter's going to talk about. Number five, the Sabbath principle. What's the Sabbath principle? The Sabbath wasn't something that God made up on Mount Sinai for Moses in the Ten Commandments. And God rested on the seventh day. That means that God ordered time around the six plus one principle. That's why it's non-negotiable. That's why you hear me harp on it so much. It's like, how come he's always on that? <laughs> I'm on it because I, if you will live according to that principle, it will change your life. If you will do what God says and work your tail off for six days, and then on the seventh day, get up and shut all the work off and do everything on that day to the glory of God. You get up in the morning, you start with your family devotions, and you start around the word of God and prayer, and then you come as a family and you worship God in spirit and in truth, and then you spend that afternoon uh, doing uh, works of ministry with one another and hospitality and having each other into each other's homes, and then you come back and you close your Sabbath day with worship on Sunday evening to the Lord. Lord, that will change your life. You've got to trust me, it will change your life. And none of us believe it. But Adam didn't believe it either, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> but, but Jesus came so that you would believe it again. And I always tell people, you think Jesus ever missed the Sabbath? You think he was like, you know, over at the football game on the Lord's Day? Ay, ay, ay. Uh, number six, uh, the goodness of creation. Uh, we're going to see that creation is not bad. Creation is good. And God saw that it was good. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a word to you in the next couple of weeks called Gnosticism. Uh, but what that simply means is that we, uh, we, we want to abandon the material world. And we think we're more spiritual to the extent that we do that. And if we abandon the spiritual world, then that's when we become really spiritual. And then we get secret knowledge. Uh, and what the Lord says is that's just all bunk and has nothing to do with your Bible. The creation's good. Uh, he wants you to be completely involved in his creation, but he wants you to restore his creation. How do I know that? Because Jesus was human. The perfect human. And upon his resurrection, is Jesus human now? Yes. You don't understand Christianity unless you understand that Jesus maintains his glorified body. He is a physical presence in a glorified body now, the same body that you will get. And that is God's stamp of approval on his material creation. 
He's saying, I never said that was bad. I just said you screwed it up. It was good. You're bad. Speaking to Adam. All right. Uh, and, and the seventh one is the fruitfulness of creation. Be fruitful and multiply is the command of God to all those who are in Christ. Uh, we, uh, and be fruitful and multiply doesn't just mean have seven kids. Uh, be fruitful and multiply uh, is for the entire creation. We are to flourish as image bearers in God's creation, uh, making sure that light is everywhere. In every category of life, uh, light is uh, everywhere. All right, let's go. Uh, the final thing, let's talk about uh, creaturely thinking, the structure of idolatry, and the workflow of idolatry. I'm going to give you a little matrices here. to chase that board all over the place. So, all ideology equals idolatry. That's the structure. All uh, ideologies, counterfeit gospels, stem uh, from idolatry. They take something out of creation, they elevate it above creation and say this particular created thing has more value than anything else in the created order. Uh, and we're going to worship it and we're going to read the rest of creation through this one thing. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. So you end up uh, completely uh, with counterfeits uh, for everything. So what that means is everything is religion. Uh, when, G, uh, when Paul said in Romans chapter 1 uh, that if uh, you will not worship your creator, you will worship everything else. Everyone is religious at the root. Everyone is making a religious commitment to whatever their little ideology is. They have valued it as the primary interpreter of their life. They have said, this is the way to best organize my life. This is the best way to be human. That's called a religion. Now, they don't use the term religion. If you say to them, that is a religion, they'll say, oh, no, it's not. And that itself is a religion. Anything that you use as the narrative to bring ultimate interpretation to your, the whole of your existence, to organize your life around, that is a religion. And so everything we're dealing with is either true religion or false religion. It's really that uh, simple. So let's just, I have a little matrices here, and for the sake of time, I won't try to pretend that I memorized it. Because this is sort of where we're going, okay? So we'll do, uh, we'll do wokeism, we'll do selfism. And by the way, that's where you get all the sexual stuff. But the real problem is uh, the elevation of the autonomous self, all right? Uh, and then we'll do statism, because anytime you have the autonomous self uh, who becomes uh, their own god, eventually they realize that they're not enough to make everybody else do what they want, so they get together in a collective and they call that a state. Uh, then they tell you what to do. All right? So we want to go across the top with uh, creation, fall, redemption, which is, fall is evil. This is the evil they talk about. Redemption is how am I delivered for this? And, and then the consummation. Where does it all end up? All right? uh, so uh, in wokeism, um, of course, in spontaneous generation. How'd you get here? I don't know. It was a big bang and... It's a complete accident, and uh, no one knows. I just showed up. Oh, good. You're kind of cute. That's lucky for you. So you just showed up. What's the problem in wokeism? Is we're going to see this. I'm not going to be able to develop it tonight. It's class oppression. And because one class has oppressed another class, 
That's the evil that has to be solved. And how do you solve that? You solve that with distributive justice. Uh, when you go to jail for killing somebody, that's uh, retributive justice. Distributive justice is, since we have an evil in the world, we have to take everything and redistribute it to everybody equally. So that's, so there's the creation, the fall, the evil that happened was class oppression. The way we get deliverance from the class oppression the evil is distributive justice. And, uh, and, and of course, the consummation is a classless society. Uh, in selfism, again, spontaneous generation. Uh, and here, the evil is that our freedoms have been suppressed. Freedom suppression. Uh, there's been every piece of authority tells me what to do. And so in selfism, you want to be able to overcome anything uh, that's authoritative in your life, including your own body. And you'll see how this uh, develops. Um, and so uh, how do you get delivered from that? You get delivered from an unhindered self-expression. And, and the consummation of that is a complete overthrow of authority. The only way for me to be the real me is to get away from everything uh, that uh, limits me. And so the only way that I can be the real me uh, is to mutilate my body. It's in there somewhere. All I got to do is cut some things off or reposition some things and I'll find the real me. It gets that stark. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to quote for you no one that's a Christian in all this. I'm going to quote for you only uh, godless, pagan, sociologists, psychologists, all that kind of stuff because everybody knows what, this is what the problem is. Everybody. Everybody knows. Uh, in statism, by the way, you're here as a contractual. In other words, with a state, the uh, autonomous individual contracts with the state, someone bigger than them. Uh, so it's actually, uh, a, a, you'll hear it called a social construct. So it's contractual. Uh, the fall in this problem is individualism, right? The state can't have a bunch of individuals. We got to you know, we've got to flatten that out a little bit. Uh, and then redemption is safety. By the way, that's why you hear safety all the time. It's not safe. It's not safe. And, safe. and all you got to do to get someone off your back is say, well, we just wanted to be safe. So that's what's going on now. Uh, and then, of course, utopia. And that's what they're promising you. And by the way, I'll just read you directly from these uh, thinkers um, and uh, you, they use the word utopia openly. You know, Bill Gates, all these guys, utopia, it's open. This is what we're trying to get to. Alright, one more thing before we go. The workflow. How does this happen? How does this happen? Because, uh, you know, I'm going to quote people to you that no one has ever read in their life. And, and how is it possible uh, that people uh, get to these conclusions and honestly, and, and I'm, this is, again, I'm, this is not a criticism. They honestly have no idea how they got here. And that's legitimate. They really don't know. That's, I'm, you know I'm not poking fun of them. They actually don't know how they arrived at these conclusions. Uh, but there's a certain uh, workflow uh, that you will see. And it goes this way, and here's the path, and we'll watch the path as we go through these things. It starts uh, with uh, philosophers and thought leaders, who no one ever reads except a few people. Uh, and then it filters down into the arts. That's all the music people hear. That's all the uh, the entertainment. That you know everything down to the comedy shows, the theater, you know whatever it is. And then after it goes to the arts, uh, that's uh, when it shows up at the pub. 
So I'll just give you a quick example before we go. So in 1625, uh, someone named Rene Descartes said something that you've all heard. I think, therefore I am. Remember that line? I think, therefore I am. Almost everybody's heard that. That's Rene Descartes. Do you know what, uh, what it means when, it, when he said, I think, therefore I am? He meant that the only way for me to know that I'm a human is through subjective knowledge. There's nothing outside of me. The only way for me to know that I am is that if I think, not if God thinks. So okay, we didn't pay much attention to that. Then some guy named Immanuel Kant came along, we call it the Kantian turn in philosophy, and Kant said this, the, uh, the object that is known is impacted by the observer of the object. Now that sounds highfalutin, right? But what that simply means is there is nothing that's objectively true out there. What makes something true is the observer of the truth. Again, I can't find five people who've read Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant. Right? But then, all of a sudden, uh, Frank Sinatra comes along and sings, you know, I gotta be me. Uh, and, you know, uh, Freedom so uh, Soul sings, you know, uh, living my truth. And then a couple of years ago, I, I, I saw a Shania a Twain interview, and she said in an interview, I'm gonna quote her uh, correctly, I sing my own truth, I am the song. I am the music. I write the song. And that filters down into every comedy show people watch. You know, what's the laugh track laughing to? And it filters into our thing, and we don't think much about it, and it comes down in the song. And the next thing you know, you got Rene Descartes, and you got Shania Twain, and then there's some guy uh, down at the pub that says, well, that's okay, pal, everybody's got their own truth, no big deal. He doesn't even know why he said that. Right. He doesn't know where it came from, he doesn't know how he got there. He just is going to spew out something that's virtually philosophical nonsense. But he'll say it as if he's Aristotle himself. <laughs> Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Uh, so what we're going to do in now the next 11 weeks is I'm going to unpack all of these things for you and show you how simple it is. It's not complicated at all. How it's filtered down from thought leaders through the arts to the guy down having a beer uh, down, uh, down at the pub. Uh, and you don't need to be afraid of it. God is on his throne. His church will conquer. Uh, but it's good to know uh, when you're dealing with people that when they claim to be wise and they become fools and they look, they're positioning themselves as, as if you're stupid, but they're Aristotle, that God is on your side. All right? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight uh, for uh, this uh, time together. I pray that uh, even though this may be some uh, difficult material, uh, that through your spirit you'll give us wisdom and clarity. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen.